This is the third and final lecture on said rocks. In the textbook, it is chapter 5.3. And I want you to recall that interpretation is the key. These are the recorders of Earth history. And so to understand what has happened in Earth's past, we have to be able to look at the sedimentary rocks and understand the source, the provenance, the transport, which is also impacted by topography and climate and the depositional environment. And all that information is held within sedimentary rocks in the rock types and the sediments themselves and then also the structures that are present in the rock. And the part that I haven't yet taught you about are those structures. So I'm gonna go through a list today. Today's topic is structures in sedimentary rocks. And these are structures that can inform process. Or they inform depo, depositional environment. Depot system is sometimes how we shorten it in the science. And then we're just gonna go through this. There's, there's nine of them. Most of these have sketches. The first structure that I want you to know is a bed. And this is just a single layer. In a sequence of sedimentary rocks, oftentimes there's many beds because there's many layers stacked on top of one another. If we have a cliff face, like in the Grand Canyon, we could just see stripe after stripe after stripe after stripe after stripe going down. A single one of these layers is called a bed. So we're gonna say that this is a single layer and it represents an, an event. Or maybe it represents a period of time. But it's individual in some respect. Whether it's a thousand years or a day, it's a single event or a period of time. When they're really skinny, we call them a, a lamination. Because a lamination means like a sheet of paper. And sometimes beds can be that thin. Other times they might be six, uh, six feet. Maybe I should say meters. One meter. Two meters thick. All right. Number two, strata. Strata or strata, both pronunciations are correct, and this represents a sequence of beds. So in the sketch that we made before, if we were to group a bunch of these beds together, then that would be called a strata. Let's say sequence of beds in a package. Now one thing I should say as we're in this idea of beds and strata, Definitely remember concepts of original horizontality. And remember superposition. And even remember present is key to the past. What was the word for that? Uniformitarianism. All of these guiding principles of geology really best apply to sedimentary rocks. And you're going to be able to see how original horizontality and superposition apply to beds and strata. And uniformitarianism is going to apply to these other things like mud cracks and dunes that we're heading towards. All right, number three on our list is a ripple mark. And a ripple mark, I might as well just show you a picture as we get, just to get this started. I'm going to show you one that's ancient and one that's young. You've seen ripple marks before. It's these. It's these ripples of sand on a beach or in a river. And here we got an old geologist standing next to a tilted sandstone bed. And look at that. On the surface, there are ripple marks. They're not soft anymore. They might have formed 300 million years ago. But we can interpret now how this sandstone formed by some modern analog because we see the ripple marks produced. So the definition of a ripple mark, it's a centimeter scale hill little short hill, centimeter scale hill, formed by or produced by um, sand deposited from a moving fluid. So centimeter scale hill produced by sand deposited by moving fluid. Now you might think I should say water because on the beach or on a river, definitely, but you can have ripple marks formed by wind. So we're gonna just be more general and say the word fluid. I'm gonna just make a quick sketch of it as well. And they kind of look almost like little waves sometimes. Sometimes they're more symmetrical, but commonly they, they're, they're like this and, and there's little laminations even inside of them and the fluid moves in this direction. And actually the, the, the backside here is steeper 
than the front side. So you can read which direction the fluid was moving in a 300 million year old sandstone just by looking how steep the ripple marks are. Now if there's a ripple mark and you make it at a grander scale by almost the exact same process, we have a different name for it and this is called a dune. And you've all seen dunes before, so I probably don't need to show you a modern picture of the Sahara, but these are meter scale, meter scale hills, also produced by sands deposited from a moving fluid. The same process as a ripple mark. It just is water or wind that's moving faster. Okay, so meter scale hills by water or wind. There are dunes that form underwater, even though typically we associate dunes as sand dunes. If I'm, gonna, I'm gonna draw here a sand dune. And the way this works is that wind is blowing, let's say in this direction, and we have a little grain of sand, and it moves its way by little jumps, saltation maybe from fast blowing wind, up to the top of the hill where it will come to rest. Eventually, this, the backside over steepens, and when it go, gets too steep, we will slump in a little mass wasting event. So slump when too steep. This process of sand climbing by the wind and then slumping down the backside produces an internal structure to a dune of these tilted beds. If we were to like take a dune and slice it in half. This becomes important for number five because this feature of the interior of a dune is sometimes preserved in the rock record even though the full dune no longer exists. It's been partially eroded away. And when we see this partial preservation of a dune, we see a feature called a crossbed. Or, oftentimes in a sentence, you'll say, this rock preserves crossbedding, with the ing added. And we're going to define this as preserved portions of dune interior. And the feature that we're going to want to see is a series of stacked um, tilted beds. In fact, I'm going to say, in, in fact, look at that, it's right there in the name, cross beds. And so I, I, what did I say? I said tilted and stacked. So stacked and tilted, that's another way of saying these cross beds. In fact, what was it going to look like? So we could see, this is, this is what it might look like in the rock record. You get a bunch of beds and then above it you get another set that is actually in a different direction. Maybe the wind was blowing to the north and then the dune got eroded away as the winds changed to the south and, and only part of the dune was preserved. Let me show you a picture of this in nature so you can see what I'm talking about. All right, this is, this is great. So we have here is a modern system on the left and we see, you can almost see the dunes back here in the back and here's an erosion section through these modern dunes and we can see the bedding or lamination here and then there's a contact between where, where dune number one built up on top of dune number two and the interior structure of dune number two is at a different angle. When we see beds that are crossing one another at this contact, it's called the cross bed. And so now let's go backwards in time. I think this is near, somewhere in Arizona. And what we can see here are a series of red sedimentary rocks and follow, follow the, the bedding. Here's some in this direction and now here's some that are tilted slightly up. Here's some that are tilted slightly down. Here's some that are tilted slightly up. Here's some that are down. And you can see that they are starting to cross one another. So this is cross bedding preserved in an ancient sand dune and it tells us something about that ancient environment that we can interpret. All right, good. Number six is, is graded bedding. Six. Graded bedding. So in grades in school, you get A's and B's and, and C's. No D's, hopefully, in my class. In graded bedding and sedimentary rocks, instead of A's and B's, it's particle sizes. It's differences in particle sizes that change across a bed. And it tends to be a consistent thing where particles either get bigger or they get smaller as you go across the thickness. So if here's a single bed, it would be a graded bed if we had a bunch of big chunks. Let me use more technical verbiage. We have 
cobbles and pebbles near the top, and then those give way to pebbles and sand. And then at the base, maybe it's just tiny little silt. All right, but there's a grain size change across the bed. We, the technical term for that is graded bedding. There's two different types of graded bedding. You can have, well, there's probably more than that, but there's something called normal graded bedding, and there's something called reverse graded bedding. Normal graded bedding has finer particles on top, and reverse graded bedding has coarser on top. And so my picture that I drew on the side is an example of reverse graded bedding. All right, and then number seven, the final sedimentary structure I'd like you to be able to interpret is called mud cracks. And mud cracks are evidence of drought. Of drought, you have seen mud cracks in a puddle or a lake that is dried out. And what ends up happening is that mud shrinks when, um, so the mud at the bottom of a pond shrinks when the water evaporates and cracks start to get produced and crack, crack, crack. Okay, that's what I'm drawing over here. And the angle that should be produced by nature is 120 degrees. It's like the it's the lowest stable two-dimensional shape, which is why hexagons are very common in nature. Of course, I just drew that on a five-sided, a pentagon, but um, and that happens in nature too. They should be 120, they should all be six sides. So anyways, a mud crack is hexagonal. It's a hexagonal cracking pattern that forms as water is removed by evaporation. We'll say hexagonal cracking pattern of mud. As water is removed, sure. The reason why I hesitated there is because yes, water is removed, but then also what's happening is that volume's going down. Volume um, lessens. And as volume lessens, then we have to have the cracks form. Anyways, that's how it's all related. And then what ends up happening is the next flood will come through, some sediment will fill those cracks, and will preserve it in the rock record. So then cracks fill at next flood or water-rich period. And so then this can also get preserved in the rock record and provide this evidence of drought. So we're almost done now with sedimentary rocks. And I just want to end with a concept about interpreting depositional environments. Because if you get a job as a sedimentary geologist, you, whether you're in oil or you're in academia or, or, or some other trade, you're almost certainly going to be, or right, uh, paleontology, you're going to be working to interpret a depositional environment. And so what I want to do is list the various depositional environments. And I want you to just picture with me what rock types you'd expect, what sedimentary rock types, whether you're up in the high mountains and you're at a glacier, or, or maybe, I'm just going downstream here, you're at a mountain stream. How will the particles look different or similar at a small mountain stream relative to a glacier? They will be different. And in my class, I will hold you accountable to be able to figure that out. An alluvial fan. Or a desert. Or what about like a normal just a normal river, or if that normal river goes into a delta, or the normal river gives way to a lake. Each one of these are depositional environments that matter, and the sediments record which one we are in. The delta could go, uh, the delta could then go into a shallow marine environment that has waves and hurricanes come through it or you could eventually even take that sediment out to a deep marine environment where there's not much fluid motion and therefore the particles will be very small and then i guess in a lot of ways what i'm hoping you're doing here is you're thinking about particle size right going from big particle size to small and you're going from rounding that's going to be much more angular with little transport to rounded by the time you're near shorelines, right? Because you've traveled so far. And then from sorting as well, you're gonna be poorly sorted with little transport. And by the time you have been able to winnow away and break down things, you should be much more organized at the 
the, de the depositional environments with lower energy. So you should be like well sorted by the end.